Well, we have five, so uh, six. All right, there we go. Um, so good morning. Welcome to the city council meeting for May 24th. Uh, we'll start with the uh, invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. I've asked uh, Councilman Greenwell to lead us in a prayer. And uh, so would everybody stand? Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the many blessings you've given us in the city. We ask for continued guidance and uh, understanding as we uh, look at the next year's budget. Help us identify the, the issues that uh, are important to the citizens and, and help us to make this the best city possible. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Please join me in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, there is nothing from the office of the mayor, so we will recess the council meeting and convene as the finance committee. Mr. Vice Mayor, this morning we have three presentations, uh, public transportation and parking, public works and the utilities department. First up is Jason Fairbrush with public transportation and parking. Well, good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, Jason Fairbrush, uh, Public Transportation Parking Department. I'm uh, pleased to have the opportunity this morning to present the FY 2017 proposed budget for the Public Transportation and Parking Department. Um, I'd like to recognize a couple of staff that were very uh, helpful in developing the budget and preparing uh, this morning's presentation. I have uh, Melissa Rousey, our Financial Services Manager, with us this morning, and of course, uh, Michael Scroggins, our Manager of Marketing. Uh, customer relations and technology who uh, put the presentation together. So, um, you know, it truly is a, a very exciting time to be part of all the different initiatives and projects that um, are going on in Oklahoma City. And um, in particular, we're very excited to be part of what's happening uh, with public transportation uh, here in our community as well. And so um, looking uh, ahead to FY17, I think you know, before we do that, one of the things I wanted to do was um, actually take a look back at some of the significant events that occurred in the uh, current uh, fiscal year. Um, and we had a, a, a few milestones that I think are worth discussing, and, and really the idea here is to give you a sense of some of the things we accomplished uh, in the previous year and to assure the City Council that the budget we've developed for FY17, we're confident, will allow us to continue to provide uh, high levels of customer service, both in parking uh, and in our transit operations. So um, in the fall of uh, this fiscal year, um, we had a couple of uh, significant events. One is our COTPA Board of Trustees met for a strategic uh, planning meeting where we developed uh, board initiatives. And so similar to council priorities, the COTPA Board of Trustees identified six kind of overarching organization-wide uh, type goals that provide um, guidance to staff as we manage day-to-day -day operations and allocate resources. So we're very uh, excited about adding that to our strategic business planning process. Um, also in the fall of 2015, um, our ridership growth on the fixed route bus uh, side of our operations continued. If you recall, uh, in the previous fiscal year, we saw about 9% uh, overall growth in cr cumulative passenger trips. And so we were uh, obviously very pleased to see that in the first quarter that growth continued and we saw another 5% growth on top of 9% from the previous year. And I'm pleased to report that that growth has actually continued throughout uh, this current fiscal year. We're now seeing 24 consecutive months of year over year ridership increases um, on our fixed route bus service. So we're very uh, pleased about that. Um, in the winter of 2015, of course, we expanded our pilot program for our night bus service, adding two more routes. And I have some data in the presentation that um, we'll share with you a little bit later, but the new night routes are off to a very good start. Um, and then, of course, we were awarded the uh, 2015 OTA uh, transit system 
of the year, and I mention that really uh, because of the dedication and hard work of our frontline staff, our frontline uh, supervisors, um, really to, to see them uh, get that recognition for all they do, I think is very, very um, important. Um, in the spring of 2016, of course, you'll know we uh, installed the uh, uh, public art project over in the Arts District garage, and I know many of you uh, were in attendance there, and we, we appreciate you uh, uh, celebrating that event with us. And then another uh, significant uh, event uh, just recently occurred where our COTPA Board of Trustees approved a, a contract for uh, uh, engineering services for the a design of a CNG fueling facility at our bus operations facility at 2000 South May. So we're very excited to begin uh, transitioning our fleet to alternative fuels, primarily CNG, uh, but um, also some hybrid technology, and if the opportunity allows um, even uh, the potential of some electric propulsion technology. Um, and then looking into the summer of 2016, we want to finish the current fiscal year strong, and um, one of the things we're doing is implementing phase three of our uh, bus shelter installation project. So um, as you'll recall, uh, phases one and two uh, actually provided for 45 additional bus shelters system-wide, all of them ADA accessible. Um, with phase three, we'll add 30 more. So that'll bring our, bring our total to 75 new shelters, which in essence doubles the amount of uh, shelters that we um, had in our, have in our system compared to when we started the project. So our bus shelters have been well received. And then of course, we're going to also upgrade um, our bike share equipment. We'll be um, installing, um, I should say replacing the, uh, the existing bikes with a bike that was designed really specifically for bike share. It's a much more uh, rugged bike, easier bike to ride. And so continuing to make enhancements with that transit mode as well, which we consider to be kind of to serve as that last mile of a transit trip. So that is um, FY 2016 in review, and again, we think FY 17 will be able to provide those same high levels of service. Um, looking at um, the budget book, um, you can find our department section on pages C285 through 300. And as you'll notice, that department section is organized um, with strategic uh, planning priorities and goals. Uh, towards the front uh, and also includes um, the, uh, the budget numbers and positions and such. And the format that we have uh, for the presentation this morning will follow a similar format um, to the way uh, our section is represented in the, in the budget book. Uh, with our strategic business planning process and budget being focused on the customer and, and the benefits that we deliver as a, as a department to the citizens of Oklahoma City, uh, I thought we would take a look at some feedback we've received uh, from not only the citizens, but some of our customers as well. And so the graph that I have um, on the slide here is uh, one that you've seen before. It uh, comes from our most recent citizen survey. And when citizens are asked about the areas of city services that they think need the most emphasis in the coming years, you can see that public transportation continues to score high with the condition of city streets, the ease uh, of getting around town, and police service uh, scoring higher. So we're very pleased that um, uh, transit continues to remain a priority uh, in the eyes of uh, the citizens. Um, looking at uh, some survey results from uh, an actual customer survey that we conducted back in, in November, um, I wanted to share a few uh, facts with you here that I thought would be, uh, be of benefit as we move through uh, the budget process. Um, one of the things we learned, and not surprising, but about 91% of our current customers um, walk to a bus stop. Um, of those that walk, you can see that about 53% live within a one to five minute walk of a transit stop. Another 24% are within uh, a six to 10 minute walk. So the majority of the people that are using our <coughs> service um, are located fairly close to a bus route. Then when asked about our overall service ratings, um, you can see that the, uh, our customers rated, uh, gave us about a 70% rating of uh, our overall services being either excellent or good. And so we're particularly pleased by the 29% of our customer base that rated our, our transit service as excellent. And so I share these, these, um, these facts for you in the context of the budget presentation. Again, just as a reminder that, you know, the majority of our customers that use our service, our transit service, um, probably have limited transportation op options as they're walking to the bus stop. But 
Well, they do use the service. They do use public transportation. They give it, uh, in, our, in our opinion, pretty, pretty high marks. So we're very pleased with that. Jason, before you yes. move on to the next screen, uh, can I just mention that uh, lately, uh, Embark has been focusing on advertising its bike and ride program where they're providing explanation and, and instructions on how to you know, ride your bike to a bus stop and then place the bike on the carrying rack uh, of the bus. And I think if we continue to do that, maybe we can increase that percentage you know, that don't walk uh, and still utilize the bike, I mean the bus. It certainly will expand the coverage, I think, of the bus system if, if we continue to promote that bike and ride uh, approach to using the bus. It's a great system, very easy to use, and those instructional videos that have been placed on uh, social media have been very helpful. Good. How many Good. bikes can you put on a bus? Uh, the majority of our buses, uh, two, two bikes on the front of a bus. Um, we do have uh, some bike racks that will hold three bikes. So as we, re in fact, um, it's interesting, we've, we've really seen an increase in the amount of bikes that we transport. In fact, this most recent year, we, we transported over 66,000 bikes. So um, as we order new buses, we're transitioning to the, the, the bike racks that will hold uh, three bikes. So. And all of our fixed route buses are equipped with bike racks. I've seen tons of, I mean, I really started to notice it, which I hadn't seen before, but I see um, lots of them downtown. And yeah. Jason, I'm, I'm somewhat afraid to ask this question, but if somebody were to ride their bike to a bus stop and the bike rack was full, assuming there was space inside the bus, could they bring their bike with them inside? Or yeah, we typically discourage that only right only because uh, a bike takes up a lot of space and Correct. some of our routes in particular by the time they get to the transit center are rather full right so unfortunately uh, the recommendation of the customer is wait on the next bus okay. at the same time with the improved frequencies most most of the time the next bus will be there in about 30 minutes correct well when I travel to cities that have a, a an active uh, streetcar or subway system often you'll see people bringing their bikes onto the subway uh, car and so yeah, thank you okay it's still an important component I think of riding your bike to the bus stop I'm uh, two miles a little over two miles away from the closest bus stop and by using the bike I'm there within 10 minutes so. right okay all right so um, within the uh, in the current fiscal year the public transportation parking department updated our strategic business plan as we do um, every other year and part of that strategic uh, business planning process is to identify the the, the biggest issues or, or challenges that our department is facing and um, i have the issues uh, here on this on the slide for you to look at but essentially they revolve around uh, maintaining our equipment and our facilities in a state of good repair um, developing our workforce, not only training, but retaining our people, um, and then growing our service, growing our service in a way that is uh, of benefit to our customers, but also in a way that we can sustain over the long term. Um, and then community relations is another challenge for us. We want to continue to position uh, uh, transit and parking services in the most positive light that we can within the community and demonstrate our, our willingness to partnership with our community in providing those services. Um, we do believe that, of course, all of these uh, challenges, once addressed, will support the council priority to develop a transportation system that works for all citizens. Um, in addition to that priority, we also believe that by addressing these challenges, we can contribute to council's um, emphasis on promoting thriving neighborhoods as well as maintaining a strong financial management. So we'll take a few minutes to look at each one of these issues um, and strategies before we get into um, our, our budget. So the challenge of keeping facilities and the fleet in a state of good repair, that is obviously inherent with all uh, transit systems. Um, you, you can see on the, on the slide here the programs that are most responsible for helping us be able to impact that challenge of, of maintaining a state of good repair with our fleet management and our facilities management programs really playing the most uh, prominent role. 
As far as strategies go that we have to maintain state of good repair, we obviously want to be able to replace our buses in a timely manner, so seeking those funding sources is very important. Uh, we want to continue to expand the skill set of our, our supervisors so that not, not only are we using the latest technology, we're able to take care and maintain that technology. We've invested in a lot of new technologies in our system, and I think our customers are benef benefiting from that. Obviously, we want to replace our outdated parking meters. Um, some of our parking meters, as you may be aware, that are coin operated, some of the parts are actually becoming obsolete. So that's an emphasis for us is to continue replacing and upgrading parking meters. And then we want to also uh, complete capital improvements to our facilities. And um, although transit facilities um, need some capital improvements and we have some projects underway, really on the parking side of our operations is where we, ha where we have the major capital improvements. Um, due to the aging of our facilities. In terms of results or performance measures that we track, there's, there's quite a few in the areas of state of good repair. A couple of the main ones are, uh, we obviously want to look at our on-time performance and um, the reliability of our parking meters. Um, looking at um, our bus replacement, I wanted to spend, if I could, a little bit of uh, uh, time just uh, providing our an update to our bus replacement plan to city council. Um, as you know, uh, about 18 of our 59 fixed route buses are past their useful life. And I know we've had discussions in the past and how the MAP 21 legislation really limited our ability to uh, secure federal funds for bus replacement. And so we are in a situation where about 31% of our fixed route bus fleet, again, is past its useful life. Now, uh, when I provided uh, uh, a budget present, the budget, budget presentation last year, we actually had a funding plan in place to replace nine of those 18 um, aged buses. I'm pleased to report that we've been able to narrow that funding gap uh, more this year, and we're, we actually have a plan in place to replace 14 of those 18 buses. And not only do we have the funding in place, but we've actually began uh, uh, purchasing those buses. So if you look at uh, FY 2016, the current fiscal year, we have purchased one 40-foot um, hybrid electric bus, and we expect that bus to be in service within uh, probably the next 30 to 45 days, and so we'd certainly uh, welcome the opportunity to, to display that for council if, if there's a need for that. Um, also, um, we have ordered uh, six new 40-foot CNG buses, and we expect delivery of those 40-foot buses late summer or early fall. So uh, by the end of this calendar year, we'll actually have seven new buses in service. So, um, so we're, we're certainly uh, looking forward to that new equipment. Once those new buses arrive in the fall of this calendar year, we will then order another seven 40-foot CNG buses with expected delivery in approximately 12 months. That's roughly the lead time to get new buses. Um, so where does that leave us? That leaves us really with four buses uh, that are unfunded or in need of about $1.8 million. And so what are we doing to try to close that gap? Well, thankfully with the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, recent uh, transportation legislation, the FAST Act, there are some competitive grant programs for bus and bus facilities. The first round of those programs was announced in March uh, with grant applications due in May, and we submitted um, applications uh, for both of those uh, grant programs in order to help expedite our bus replacement. In addition to those programs, we're participating with the Oklahoma Transit Association in a statewide um, Tiger grant, which will provide um, alternative fuel uh, uh, funding funding for alternative fuel uh, bus replacement. Um, again, we've submitted the app. We don't know um, exactly where we're at in the competitive process. And then, of course, in the past, we've ha been fortunate enough to be uh, included in the GEO bond program. We've been able to utilize GEO bond funds for replacement of buses. So um, we do feel like we're uh, gaining some ground on our, on our bus replacement and we'll continue to um, apply for any competitive grant that, that uh, is available. Can I ask you a question about that? What, what is a hybrid electric bus? How does that work? Yeah, so a hybrid electric bus is um, a combination of batteries and a small, uh, much smaller uh, diesel uh, engine. And so the diesel engine will help the bus, you know, get going from when it's, when it's stopped, and then the batteries will take over. So it's a combination of both. Have, have we looked at all electric bus 
acquisitions? Yeah, actually, uh, <clears throat> yes, we have. Actually, part of the, uh, the uh, one of the grant programs that was announced in March was a low or no emissions grant program. Uh, very competitive grant program, and, and it's our understanding that in order to really compete, it has to, chances are better if it's a no emissions, an electric propulsion technology. So we did um, submit uh, an application for funding for, uh, for electric buses, uh, two electric buses. What, what kind of capital investments required besides the bus? Are there charging stations? Yeah, there's, there's variations of different um, charging technologies. Um, since this is, you know, would be a new technology for us, basically what we looked at was the, uh, they call it a portable charger, but it's really just, it's a permanent charger. We would install perhaps one at the transit center and one on our maintenance facility, and when you bring the bus in, you just plug it in. Okay, fantastic. Yep. Thank you. So, yep, looking what, forward what to the results. What is the hybrid's mileage range? How far can it go and how long does it take to charge? Uh, well, there's really, there's really no limitation on the, on the range on the hybrid because of the, the diesel motor. So um, the, fuel, the fuel miles obviously are much better than a traditional diesel, but there's no limitation on range. We can put one out at 5 o'clock in the morning and bring it back that evening. What, what do we do with the old um, buses? Do we, uh, do we generate any revenue from, from those? Yeah, we, we do. Um, we uh, basically auction them off and then... Uh, Who usually buys them? Like what, I'm wondering what, yeah. what other use well, do they have? We've, uh, we've, we've done it a couple different ways. Um, sometimes uh, we will actually have an auction on site at our facility and leave it up to the auction service to attract the buyer base to come in and bid. They'll usually know who's interested in those type of vehicles. Uh, most recently, we actually had our vehicles transported to a, uh, basically a vehicle auction. So the, the, the buyer base was just vehicle buyers. Okay. Um, so as you can imagine with a, a worn out bus, many times, you know, blown engine or such, you know, they don't, they don't bring a lot, right. uh, but we do, uh, According to FTA, we do uh, we are required to keep those proceeds and put them towards the next bus bus purchase. Okay, thanks. Jason, one last question. So, how does the hybrid electric compare to the CNG in terms of maintenance and operations costs? Yeah, well, uh, they're comparable. Um, in fact, as we looked at doing uh, transitioning our fleet to CNG, we did an analysis of diesel, CNG, and hybrid technologies in terms of maintenance costs. Um, don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but the CNG and the hybrid were, were comparable. Um, in fact, uh, where you really get the gains from the hybrid is on the fuel economy, but of course it's a much more expensive upfront purchase price. So it's, just a, you know, it's really just a balance of how long you wanna keep the, bu keep the bus in order to get your payback. But <clears throat> as we move forward, we're actually looking at primarily CNG technology, but continuing with uh, you know, using or trying new technologies such as hybrid and electric. So if the hybrid electric <clears throat> continues to improve, I mean, we're not committed for the next 13 to do CNG. We could, we could adapt in 2018 if... We could. We, we certainly have that option. Um, the, we are making a pretty significant uh, investment in infrastructure for a CNG uh, fueling facility. So... Um, you know, primarily we're looking at mostly CNG buses. Okay. But again, with 59 buses and a bus replacement plan that essentially extends over 10 years, we do have options and we'll be revisiting our, our propulsion technology and future purchases. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, back to uh, uh, state of good repair. I um, did want to talk real quickly about elevator repair and maintenance. Um, as many of you know, uh, we uh, uh, had a project uh, ongoing this year to replace the four elevator cabs at the Santa Fe parking garage. That modernization project um, was not without its complications. In fact, we had a lot of reliability issues. Um, I am pleased to report that um, taking that project a, a couple of steps further uh, with our vendor in terms of not only working with the local vendor, but also a regional office. We were able to get uh, some, some very good technical assistance, and I'm, I'm pleased to report that I believe 
the, uh, the issues with the Santa Fe uh, elevators have been stabilized. In particular, we had one elevator, elevator number two in the North Tower that gave us a lot of problems, um, was down uh, about three weeks of April shortly after coming online. Uh, but we have been able to resolve those issues and, and actually of the last 25 days, uh, 23 of the days we've had no interruptions in elevator service um, at the Santa Fe parking garage. Uh, since April, our uptime, <clears throat> excuse me, at Santa Fe has been about 93%. And then um, if you look at our elevators system-wide, we're at about a 94% uptime during that same time frame. And I mentioned those uptime percentages because with the uh, challenges that we had with this modernization project, it really gave us an opportunity to look at our elevators system-wide. We have about 14 elevators that we're responsible for maintaining. And so what we just determined was back in December, we're gonna start tracking our elevator uptime on a daily basis. We're gonna establish our baseline. Since then, we've entered into a new, new agreement with a uh, elevator repair and maintenance vendor with emphasis on preventative maintenance. And so we, we're now doing more preventative maintenance on the elevators. And then in addition to that, we're continuing to track elevator uptime so that we can see the impact of, of this new maintenance program and it, does, it, does it help, does it, does it at least allow us to maintain our uptime percentages and so um, that's kind of, a, kind of an update on where we are with the, with the uh, elevators. Um, and then lastly I wanted to mention the Arts District parking garage and um, we have a, an image here of the public art. I think it's, it's neat that our uh, first public art piece uh, in our parking system actually goes in the Arts garage. Um, and I'm sure most of you have had a chance to, 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 to look at that. Um, I did want to report that we are continuing with phase two of the tenant build out at the Arts District Garage. We expect that project to be done in July, so we'll have three more tenants uh, moving into the first floor of that, uh, of that structure, uh, leaving really about 1,100 uh, square foot of space available. So in, so in essence, that first floor is nearly full, and so we're, we're very glad to have those tenants. Jason, I really want to thank you for the work on the Sheridan Walker garage, too. It looks like it's coming along and uh, give us some life back on the street, which is what the objective was, I think. So. Right, and, and, and that, and absolutely, and, and we've been partnering with utilities on that. A lot of that work that you see is, was, you know, um, in cooperation with utilities, and we actually have some other, uh, other uh, plans for projects that we'll be moving forward, so. Thank you. Um, Next issue is workforce development. So recruiting, retaining workforce, uh, obviously very important to us. We have a couple of uh, employees here on the slide. We have uh, Mark Galloway, you see there, uh, one of our experienced uh, body technicians who's responsible for doing all the repairs to the dents and dings that get in the buses, uh, painting, that kind of thing. One of our longtime bus operators, uh, Jeff Gray on the right. But you know, uh, being able to retain um, employees is just, uh, very, very critical to our transit operations, all the uh, experience and knowledge that they bring. Um, and so developing our workforce is something we try to emphasize consistently uh, throughout the year. Some of the strategies that we have in place to develop our workforce, we want to continue our safety training classes. We want to continue with our retention team meetings. Um, we've also made a lot of progress in installing access control and up upgrading security. Our at our facilities and we feel like that's important to employees to provide a, a very safe uh, work environment for them. Um, as far as results or performance measures go, um, obviously a couple of the things we look at are accidents. We want to keep accidents to a minimum and turnover to a minimum as well. I will say that this year we had uh, an unexpected or, or uh, basically an unexpected amount of retirements that's impacted our turnover, uh, but again we've uh, been very diligent in filling those vacant positions. Uh, the next slide here gives you an example of a, a couple of the, of the specific things we've done in the areas of workforce development. I won't go into each of these, but a couple of them are wor worth mentioning. Starting in the uh, top uh, middle of the screen, you'll notice we provide about 1,400 hours of new bus operator training on an annual basis. We have one trainer, so that's about 70% of his time he's in a classroom talking to new hire uh, bus operators about you know, how to operate a bus, how to safely operate the bus. So we think uh, we have a lot of efficiency there in training. And then uh, at the bottom of the screen, I'll point this out too, I think this is a, a very uh, positive thing in terms of workforce development, and that is we've seen a 29% increase 
in the number of women that we've hired as um, operations uh, managers. So that's a mid-level uh, management position. And then we've also seen increases in uh, minority hires in our operations management division as well. Uh, currently about 36% of our uh, route supervisors are, are women and about 28% are minority. And um, th those that staff and operations just does an excellent job uh, each day. Uh, Growing our transit service and being able to sustain that growth over the long term, um, as I mentioned, is, is certainly a challenge for us, um, whether it be our transit operations program, our ADA uh, programs, or even some of our special uh, services, such as uh, the trips we provide uh, to seniors for non-emergency medical transportation or trips to congregate meal sites. All those trips, we feel, um, uh, are important. They improve the quality of life. Uh, for our community, and so we certainly want to make sure we can sustain the services that we have out there. Um, in terms of strategies go, uh, we obviously want to maximize our ridership, and as we've mentioned before, we want to seek uh, funding alternatives to replace our buses. Um, one of the primary ways we look at our abilities to sustain our service is through ridership, and so I have a few slides here that will give you an idea of our ridership. Total weekday ridership uh, is on this next slide. It's a slide that you've seen before. Uh, basically, we have uh, two items on this graph. One is our riders per service hour, and again, that's really kind of a measure of efficiency of our system, and it, and it allows us to compare ridership from year to year, particularly when we have changes in the number of service hours. So you can see that our riders per service hour has been relatively stable at about 18. We were at nearly 19 back in FY12, but since then, we've been right around 18. Uh, the other side of that coin, of course, though, is looking at the uh, total service hours provided. And this is where uh, you see all the, all the frequency enhancements and, and additional services that we've been able to uh, uh, bring, to, bring to the table over the last few years. That translates to additional service hours. So since FY11, our total service hours have increased by about 33,000 or about 24%. The largest increase, of course, is from FY14 to FY16, where we actually have seen about a 24th, we've seen an increase of about 24,000 service hours, or about a 17% increase. And so I share those numbers again, uh, just to, to show that our service hours have increased pretty substantially, and yet we've been able to maintain a constant riders per service hour number. And again, um, what you would normally expect to find in transit is when you add a, a new line or a new service, it takes people a little while to either adjust their travel habits or begin using the service more often or even to attract new customers to the system. So what you'll normally see is when service hours go up, you'll see a downward uh, trend in riders per service hour. We haven't really seen that and we think that just speaks to how quickly the changes were embraced by our community and the fact that the investment that has been made in public transportation over the last few years has certainly been um, a good one. Another way to look at ridership is looking at cumulative ridership. Um, for FY15, our last full fiscal year, um, we provided over 3 million passenger trips on our fixed route bus service. And I highlight that because although we've exceeded 3 million trips in recent years, that has been all services combined. So FY15 was the first year where we exceeded the 3 million trip mark just on our fixed route bus service. And if our growth trend continues this year, we expect to finish FY16 at about 3.2 million passenger trips. So um, again, we just continue to see uh, uh, additional trips on our fixed route uh, bus system. And then finishing the ridership discussion, we can look at our night shift, and this is the total amount of passenger trips provided each month since we started our night service. And so you, as you'll recall, we started our pilot program back in January 15, um, got off to a little bit of a slow start and then leveled off. Um, we added two additional routes, routes five and 13 in in, in January of 2016. And I think what's encouraging about um, this, this graph is we added that service at the very end of January. So for all, all purposes, just slightly over two months, we basically doubled um, our night ridership. And so <clears throat> again, I think um, our, the, the night service, keeping the buses out to midnight is being well received and, and used by a lot of people. 
Jason, you mentioned the expansion of these routes at night, and, and I'm really excited about that. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about what we're currently offering and how we've expanded those routes? Sure, yes, I'd be glad to. Um, we have uh, our current night service is comprised of four routes, um, and we have uh, service from uh, 7 p.m. to midnight um, on our fixed route bus operations. The frequencies during that time frame are one hour as opposed to the day. They're typically 30 minutes. And then as far as the coverage goes, we have Route 5, which runs and serves the north side of Oklahoma City, actually all the way out to Mercy Hospital. We have Route 13N, which serves the south side of Oklahoma City, um, uh, providing service to OCCC. Um, we have uh, Route 23, which is a north side cross town, basically east to west along 23rd primarily. And then we have Route 11, which is a south side cross town, east to west primarily on uh, southwest 29th. And I actually have a, a slide here uh, coming up that'll, that will show actually a, a, a map of our night service routes. So, Any plans for expanding in Midtown, Downtown, Ricktown routes at night? Yeah, at, at this time, no, we don't have any, any proposal for additional um, routes. Um, when we do begin looking at uh, potential night service expansion in the future, we do have a, a couple of routes that we've been getting requests on. You know, when are we going to be having night service on this particular route? So there is demand out there, there is interest, and we have, um, we have a few routes in mind to look at initially. Isn't that called the streetcar? Yeah. For, for Midtown and Downtown, exactly. The streetcar is going to be so popular that we're going to need buses too. That's right. <clears throat> Okay, community relations, expectations for later evening and weekend service, as well as alternative public transportation, environmental stewardship. All these are, are issues that we, we balance on a daily basis as we're interacting with our community and again, positioning transit as one of the uh, leading partners for um, community organizations. Uh, our public information program certainly um, influences our ability to um, react to this challenge and you can see some other programs on the slide that are listed there as well. Um, in terms of strategies, we obviously want to improve customer satisfaction and continue to bring new amenities to our customers. Uh, maintaining clean facilities and vehicles is important and we want to continue to partner with uh, community organizations. As far as performance measures go, obviously we want to look at our customer satisfaction because a lot of times how our customers perceive us is also how the community perceives us. And we want to continue to bring enhanced amenities both on the transit side and on the parking side of our operations. <clears throat> so got a, a couple of more uh, survey results to share with you and these have to do with customer satisfaction in the areas of, of facility and bus cleanliness. And so um, looking at uh, transit center cleanliness, you can see that um, we received pretty high marks here with about 29% of respondents um, indicating that transit center and the facility there was, was clean. Uh, we, we received excellent ratings there. 41% indicated that the cleanliness of the transit center um, was good. Um, on the cleanliness of buses, we had a 23, almost 23% 23 uh, ranking the cleanliness of buses as excellent with about 38% uh, ranking the cleanliness of buses as good. And so uh, I mentioned that because as you think about the fact and the fact that we provide about 11,500 passenger trips a day, there's a lot of foot traffic that goes through the transit uh, center. Um, in addition to that, once we've had you know, a couple of hundred people uh, on a bus, you can imagine the challenge of keeping those facilities and those buses clean. But again, I think uh, based on the, the survey results here, uh, we're doing a, a pretty, pretty good job in those areas, but we'll continue to look at ways to improve. In terms of amenities, I know this is a a map that you've seen before, but I wanted to update it to sh uh, show you um, what we have planned for phase three of our bus shelter installation project that I mentioned. What you see here is uh, with the blue dots, the 45 bus shelters that were part of phases one and two of our shelter installation project. Um, the yellow dots are the next 30 that we have planned. In fact, we actually have half of the sh uh, shelters ordered, so we'll be moving very quickly on these additional shelters. And then um, with the green triangles, we also have 11 locations where we have existing stops or shelters that we're simply improving accessibility. So again, in essence, we're doubling the number of shelters that we have in our system. And again, each one of these new shelters as they are constructed 
are ADA accessible, they all have security lighting, and they all have um, trash receptacles. So they've been very well received by, by our customer base. And although we've spent uh, quite a bit of time talking about transit customer service, also wanted to uh, provide you uh, with an update on parking occupancy because obviously maintaining high levels of customer service with our parking customers is important as well. And, and uh, we certainly appreciate uh, the patience, particularly of those customers that have, that have been with us in the Santa Fe parking garage uh, this year during the elevator modernization project. However, you can see uh, this is our occupancy rate. Um, in FY 2011, we were at about 85%. We steadily increased in FY 14 at almost 100 and, or I should say 119% occupancy. And then you'll see a bit of a decline um, in the occupancy rates in the downtown parking garages. There's a couple of factors influencing that. One, one is the opening of the Arts District garage, which added 800 additional spaces to the system. Um, in addition to that, we have seen a little bit of a, of a decline in the monthly contract park, parkers that we believe coincides with the slowdown in the local economy. But with that, we are still basically at capacity um, right now in terms of um, parking garages. Jason, uh, do you know about the arts garage specifically, what the occupancy is of the... Yeah, right. The, uh, right now, the arts district garage is about 50%. Okay. And, and that is uh, down a couple of hundred parkers from our, from our peak at the end of the last fiscal year. So um, the other garages, <clears throat> excuse me, the other garages we've been able to maintain our occupancy, uh, but the Arts District garage is the one where we've seen the major outflows. Is that a garage, though, that we have a lot of just public turnover as well? I mean, I... Yeah, well, we yeah. do have, yeah, we are seeing a uh, transient or daily parking increase uh, right. in the Arts District garage as people become more aware of it. Right. Um, I think one of the things that we notice with the Arts District Garage is um, we have uh, smaller contract parker groups, and so we've seen some of those smaller groups leave, whereas in, say, the Century Center, Cox, Santa Fe, we have large companies with large blocks of parking that tend to keep And is full. it getting utilized at night uh, with events at the Civic Center and things? Do we have more evening activity? You know, not as much as we'd like to. Okay. Um, we would really like to... Um, event that garage more, particularly for Civic Center events. Um, when we closed the, or I shouldn't say closed, but when, when ODOT uh, took back the I-40 surface lots uh, for the boulevard construction, um, we began eventing the Arts District garage on, on uh, Thunder Game Nights and some other events just to see if we, how much activity we would, we would have. And so um, we would like to event more uh, than what we're doing right now. I heard incredibly positive feedback after the Arts Festival uh, with the amount of available parking. Um, you know, people's surveys that the Arts Council did said that it was the best parking arrangement that they can remember um, for festival. So that, kudos to that's, making that happen. Yeah, that's, that's great to have two, two parking garages in such close proximity, sure. So that that's wonderful. very good to know, thank you. Jason, you may bring it up later, but just to uh, discuss the, uh, the fact that the Arts district garage is not as heavily utilized, especially going forward, there'll be incentives available in terms of pricing for access to that garage compared to, say, Santa Fe and perhaps some of the other garages. So there is a, an effort to try to smooth out the utilization of all parking garages and those businesses that do provide monthly parking, if they are looking for ways to reduce their costs, they can look at shifting over to the Arts District uh, garage for their employees. And, right. and I would throw in this, uh, hopefully we've got people watching us in addition to members of this council, uh, to utilize that Arts District garage, especially for events like the Thunder Game. This is, that's where we always park and we're always so much ahead of the traffic as once the game's over and then we utilize the uh, boulevard to access I-40 and we're home in no time. Uh, it's a great walk through the Myriad Gardens to get to the arena and again, never any traffic problems exiting the garage. And I have seen significant problems like in the Santa Fe garage and I'm, I would suspect the Cox Center after a game with right. all the cars leaving at once. So. Yeah, we, we would agree with that. The Arts District at Sheridan Walker 
during those events empty out much faster. And really the same uh, for the Arts District garage, I believe, would apply uh, even for some businesses during, during, during the day. I mean, at 5 o'clock, the Santa Fe garage can slow down. The, some of the other garages can, and where the Arts District doesn't quite have that. So. Okay. Uh, so moving ahead and looking at our budget to support our strategic business planning uh, goals and objectives, um, one thing I wanted to mention is that the budget numbers that I'm going to share with you on the next few slides are the city and COTPA trust budgets combined. So they're not going to necessarily align to what's in your uh, budget book, but it will provide the most accurate picture of the amount of resources allocated to all parking and transportation services. Um, so looking at our uh, combined operating budget, you can see that um, our total budget is $36.8 million with 74%, uh, the clear majority of that budget, um, or almost $27 million being allocated to the bus service. Um, parking makes up 23% of our combined budget at $8.7 million, and then we have bike share and ferry uh, service making up the remaining 3%. So looking at each one of these business units, parking and transit separately, and as far as funding sources go, um, one thing uh, I think is important to, to mention on our parking funding sources is that for our off-street parking, our, gar our parking garage system, um, there's no general fund uh, support for that, parking, for that parking system. It's totally self-sufficient, so the revenues generated uh, within the uh, parking garages uh, support operations, they support debt service on the uh, Arts District parking garage, and they support our capital improvement plan. Um, looking at our uh, funding sources, you can see that for our parking operation, about 5.4 uh, million of revenue is derived from monthly contract parkers, or that's about 62% of our funding sources or revenues. 23% uh, of our revenues, or $2 million, come from events. And then our daily transient uh, parking makes up about a $1 million, or 12% of that revenue. And I also did want to mention that the uh, projected revenues that you see in this pie chart do include a recent uh, parking rate increase approved by the COTPA Board of Trustees that will go into effect uh, September 1st of 2016. And again, uh, as Councilman Greenwell was mentioning, that parking uh, rate increase is uh, kind of a demand-based increase. So not all garages will see uh, increases in parking rates. So um, then looking at transit funding sources, uh, total transit budget is just over $28 million. And as you can see, the uh, contribution from the city operating budget uh, continues to make up the largest part of the revenue uh, that we use to support uh, the bus service at $16 million, or about 56% of the overall operating budget. Um, the federal share of our operating budget is just over $7 million, or 26%. Uh, we do receive about a $1 million from the state to help us uh, support transit operations. That's about 4%. And then our fares are about $3.2 million, uh, or about 11% of our operating budget. Jason, if we can hold that real quickly, just this comment that I like to make, if we could get a third of the people, roughly, who work downtown to utilize public transportation on a regular basis, not every day, but on a regular basis, we could uh, increase that revenue from fares by over $10 million, which either could enhance the existing system or reduce how much the city has to contribute to the system and then that 10 million plus could be used for street improvements additional police officers you name it we could use that money for other uh, areas it's just up to the people to decide what they want to do and then uh, develop a plan to achieve that goal and uh, the benefits derived from using public transportation are, are, are great. You know, it reduces that individual's uh, expenses of driving their own vehicle to work in the form of parking, uh, gasoline, even insurance costs will go down for them if, if they utilize public
public transportation. And I understand the difficulties for those who have to go from one part of the city to another. That does get to be somewhat challenging at times. But those who work downtown, it's a great system, and, and they could really help the city if they would just utilize that uh, more often. Thank you. And, and Jason, could I just ask about the state funding? I don't think that number's changed for the entire time that I've been on the council. Um, do we, not that I want to rely on anybody out there, but do we have an active effort to try to increase that amount, or is it, is it a formula that they base those dollars on? <coughs> this year, we're just trying to make sure- Just trying to make get, sure we get it. You didn't get cut. Going, going at this year, this year to go and try to get an increase it would, would be futile. Right. Frustrating. Exactly right. But compared to, to peer states and cities our size, that is extremely anemic. I mean, it's just, yes. we're, we're an outlier. I mean, it's just, it's yes. obscene that, that you would, a million dollars for the, what, we're the 35th largest city in America, so. Uh, as far as major budget changes go, uh, these are all reductions uh, to our uh, budget for FY 2017. Um, <clears throat> one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the reductions we made was uh, really just transferring the funding source of um, the uh, participation in the Regional Transit Authority Task Force from the Public Transportation and Parking Department to uh, the non-departmental portion of the city's budget, so that was really just a, a transfer of expenditures, but it did end up reducing our budget. Um, we are also able to save about $125,000 through some uh, reorganization of staff duties, um, filling some, uh, some vacant positions with uh, some positions of lower classification that we felt like uh, met the, the demands of the, of the job description. Um, and you'll notice we have a, a minus one position, so we're down one position net, and that is different from, uh, I believe, the table in your budget book, and I, sh I share that with you because our department is comprised of both city employees and COTPA trust employees, and so we actually had four uh, reductions of positions on the COTPA side, um, and then we had three additions on the city side. So in net, department-wide, we're down uh, one position. Um, with the uh, reduction in fuel prices, we were able to um, save some money with fuel. So we reduced our fuel budget by about $670,000. And then the uh, last major budget change is a, is a budget reduction of $421,000, uh, which is related to the elimination of the link uh, transportation service. And so I have a few slides where we can talk a little bit about um, what that reduction uh, involves. <coughs> So as we begin um, uh, talking about the link service and the proposed reduction, um, I wanted to at least begin by sharing this map. This is a, a, a map of our existing uh, night service. Um, and <clears throat> to make sure um, everyone is aware of how the link service works, um, it is uh, what we would consider to be a, a flexible transportation service where passenger trips are provided in the small uh, cutaway vans, very similar to our paratransit vans. Um, the link service operates um, on the weeknights from 7 p.m. to midnight, and on Sundays from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, you can see by the map here that the service is provided just in the core area of the city, basically 63rd on the north, 89th on the south, Meridian on the west, and Bryant on the east. So it does not include you know, our entire uh, service area. Um, on the map, you can see each of the designated link stops highlighted by either the, the blue or the black square. The blue squares are those um, stops that link service provides Monday through Friday and on Sunday. The black squares are stops that uh, services provided on Sunday only. So there's, there's more stops, 16 stops actually available on Sunday. And so <clears throat> we refer to this as a flexible transportation option because the way it works is these, these vans don't necessarily have designated routes. They don't follow a route. What they do have are designated stops with times that they need to be at those stops. So what that allows for is as the 
operator is out making the stops, we have the flexibility to also book reservation trips. So a customer can call in to our, our contractor that provides this service, schedule a reservation trip, and as long as we can work in that reservation trip around making our normal schedule, then we want to do that. And a reservation trip is a trip where uh, we agree to pick someone up basically at a, a, spe a location they specify, generally their home or maybe their place of employer. So it's like front door service, essentially. Um, so, so that's why we describe it as being a very uh, flexible service. Um, so as we began looking at um, uh, budget, our budget reduction and looking at if we have to make a, a change to service, what kind of changes can we, can we make that impact the least amount of people? Um, we took a look at Link primarily because of the ridership. The ridership, we average about 40 trips per evening on Monday through Friday, and we average about 79 trips on Sunday. So the, so the ridership is, is a little bit limited. In fact, this graph here um, will kind of give you a, a sense of how the Link ridership compares to the fixed route ridership that we've been able to launch um, during the night. So um, this is our night service compared to um, link week, weeknight service um, represented by the, the green line and then we dropped our Sunday service in there as well represented by the orange line. So again with the link service um, we have proposed it as a budget re reduction for a few reasons. One is we do think it's a service if we're going to have to Reduce a service, it's one that affects the least amount of people. Um, in addition to that, there is some duplication. Uh, Michael, if you go back to the previous slide, you can see that about half of the weeknight stops are also served by our new night service. So there is some duplication there. In addition to that, because the uh, ridership is lower than most of our other services and there's a certain amount of fixed costs associated with providing the service. I mean you have to have an operator and a dispatcher no matter how many you know people are using the service. Um, it's, it's a pretty expensive service when you look at a per passenger trip cost. In fact right now the cost per passenger trip is about $48. We do receive about 18 of that back in federal reimbursement that's, but that's still about $30 per trip in local funds. So, um, so again, that's, that's another reason why we uh, propose this service for elimination. Um, so in terms of customers, I think it's important that we understand you know, how, how's this going to impact the existing link customers. If a uh, customer is using the service right now on a Monday through Friday and they're catching the link service at a designated stop that is also served by fixed route bus, then very little, if any, change on their travel habits. I mean, they, they'll still have that transportation. If a customer is using uh, link service Monday through Friday and their designated stop is not on a fixed route, then they are going to have less transportation options or they may have to walk further to get to a fixed route bus stop. So those are four designated stops. If a customer is using the service Monday through Friday, um, and using the reservation service, then again, um, the, the reservation service is not going to be available. If the person using the reservation service uh, requires a mobility device or is disabled in some way and they can qualify for our paratransit service, then keep in mind the other advantage to our customers by having the fixed route buses out till midnight is that our paratransit service also runs until midnight within three quarters of a mile of a fixed route uh, bus route. And in fact, um, I can show you quickly a, a map here of kind of our, our paratransit coverage area in the evening. So you can see it doesn't completely cover the existing link area, but it does cover a good portion of it and actually extends paratransit service to some areas that are, are not available now or they're not available with the link service. So that's Monday through Friday. On Sundays we, we would not have any uh, transportation. So, um, so I, I say that just again to give some context of, of maybe the impact um, to the customers. A couple of quick questions. Have we looked at breaking the cost out of, of just running Sunday only? 
and I know, I mean, obviously the fixed costs increase, so the per ride <clears throat> cost goes up. But. Right, and and yeah, we can we can easily uh, break that out. Um, and and you're right, we would probably look at a, a higher, an even higher cost per passenger trip because of some of that overhead. But the overall cost would be would be less. I'm just I'm going to guess probably not quite half, but somewhere somewhere in there. So maybe we could look at that. And um, mm -hmm. is cab share still available as an option? Do we do we fund through um, CDBG What's monies the or service, anything? That, the, uh, the share, share affair? affair? Yes, yes. In fact, I, I appreciate you uh, mentioning that um, because that, that is another option for, um, uh, for example, particularly for uh, elderly uh, individuals or, or someone with a disability, the share affair, the half price taxi program would would be available. We, if we have to eliminate Link altogether, I think that's something we need to publicize more, probably, right. and we might need to look at how that. I can't remember what the dollars are anymore, but you know, it was always a struggle to get as much yeah. as you needed. Yeah. Um, it, well, and that's an important uh, a part to mention too is that as we move forward with the elimination of Link service, we will hold public meetings to educate our customers on the changes that are coming and other options, if any. Thanks, Jason. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, One quick question. Uh, when you were discussing the four buses that remain unfunded and we're looking to alternate ways to come up with funds, you mentioned federal funding limitations, and I wasn't sure I understood that. Is that something that's unique to Oklahoma City, or is that something that's occurring nationwide? Yeah, uh, when I was uh, discussing the bus replacement plan, yes. yeah, actually uh, what, we, what happened was with uh, the MAP 21 legislation, the transportation bill that was signed into law, I believe, in 2012, um, that legislation reduced the amount of funding, federal funding available to transit agencies for bus replacement. Um, it also eliminated basically any earmarks or competitive grant programs. So we were in a situation of receiving money for bus replacement based on our formula allocation only. And since we are a large city with less density than some, we don't favor as well um, on formula allocation. So basically limited us to funding for, to replace less than two buses each year when we were looking at 18 that needed to be replaced. Thank you. I, I want to comment um, about the progress that we made over the last four or five years. I mean, I, I couldn't be more pleased. I've watched this thing, and it's been something that's been uh, dear to me to try to improve it. The, um, I do think that the bus route um, or the, the headways reduction has made a huge difference. But I'm telling you, from the public standpoint, the bus shelters are the most significant emblem of what the progress is and what it has been. Um, you, you say you, there were, how many, are, again, have been finished? Yeah, well, we have uh, about four remaining of the 45. Right. And then we're going to install an additional 30. So right. we have plans in place for 75 additional shelters. Okay. What, uh, what's the time frame on when those 75 will be completed? Yeah. Uh, no more than a year. I mean, no, no more than a year to install the additional 30. We're already... Well, at what point do we need to be thinking about funding for another 75? Well, our goal is to continue, at least in the interim, to right. add shelters each With year. With this budget, through the end of this budget, will we be tapped out? Is that in terms of... Um, we won't, we won't be tapped I, out. I we won't be I'm, able to add look, 30. I look forward to a time when almost every bus stop is, is a sheltered stop. Right. Um, I, uh, um, it, it really touches me to see people standing in the sun and the wind and the rain, trying, and we're trying to promote a bus system that, that's, you know, when we're, every time I think about the, the, the streetcar and the headways we're going to do with the streetcar and the quality of the stops, and I think about that's all going to be subsidized at a rate we've never subsidized transportation before. And then we've got these people that need to get back and forth to work. And we leave them standing out in the sun with it's still the headways are till too long. 
Uh, I think it's a tragedy that we've misplaced our, our priorities to that extent. And I, I want to see a time when every bus stop has a, has a shelter, when headways are a third of what they are now, so that the system itself can be fully utilized by people that need to use it. And if there is a subsidy, it's going to people that, are, that have to go to work rather than from Mickey Mantles to McNelly's. They're, they've got to, they're, they're using it to make a living out of. And I, I, we've made great progress in that regard in the last few years. And um, I'd, I'd like to see at some point, the, this economy will turn around. We're, we're not going to be as impacted by it as, as other, some other entities are. And perhaps even in mid-year, I'd like to see you come back with another round of, uh, at least another round of, of uh, shelters. Okay. But I appreciate what you've done. And this is not a, this is not a one-year thing. It goes back, I've, I've uh, when Rick left, I thought uh, those are going to be big shoes to fill. But I've watched your feet grow over the last couple of years, and you've done a great job. And I, I, I appreciate what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very Thanks, much. Jason. Next up is Public Works, Aaron Klinger. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, we are uh, pleased to uh, present to you this morning the Public Works Department budget for FY 16-17. Um, I've got to also extend my appreciation to several staff that are here with us this morning that assisted in the development of the budget. Assistant Director Paul Bronson. Um, I've also got our budget analyst, Mike Miller. And I've also got J.C. Reese that's assisted with a lot of the presentation materials. So it's obviously a large group effort is, uh, as we put these together for each year. Um, if you're looking at your budget book, ours starts on page C301. Um, but the summary of what I'll show you here through the slides will really outline all those pages that you have there. As I begin, the mission of Public Works is to provide infrastructure construction and maintenance private construction review and inspection and emergency first response services so the public can live, work, and play in a, in a safe environment. And so that's something that we live by every day. Obviously, we've been very invested in that this past year and even this past weekend. Um, but uh, our budget is based around all these principles. Public Works Department's made up of seven divisions. Um, we currently have 406 positions. What you'll see in this budget is we're reducing that by 15. We'll be going to 391 proposed positions. But the divisions make up engineering, field services, the Oklahoma River Corridor, project management, stormwater quality, streets, traffic, drainage maintenance, and also traffic management. This is a summary of the budget from last year and this year, and I think I'll just call your attention to the bottom slide, or at least the bottom line of this slide. Um, you'll see that uh, we're actually doing a net reduction in overall cost of about $1.1 .1 million. We're also reducing a net 15 positions. You'll see the the breakdown of those by division above, but, uh, but overall we're able to successfully move forward um, with a budget that's less this upcoming year, but we're going to really work our best to make sure that we don't lose a level of service to the public. These are the major, major budget changes. Um, the oil and gas inspection responsibilities, which have been with Public Works for a number of years, are being transferred to the Development Services Department. We're also reorganizing part of Public Works, and this is going to include our engineering division. So there is one new civil engineering position that we're going to use to manage the technical review division. This is the division I'll outline in just a moment that oversees a lot of the private plan and the public construction and the right-of-way throughout the city. We're also moving six construction project manager positions and one civil engineer to the MAPS office. These have been traditionally budgeted in public works, but these are actually permanent positions that have been in the MAPS office for some time. We're going to discontinue the contractual channel cleaning contracts, and uh, we're adding those positions to streets, traffic, drainage, maintenance to do that as an in-house service. Um, that is at no additional cost from the previous budget. We're simply going to be taking what was being provided through contractual funding and moving that to in-house funding for city positions. Funding for street maintenance materials is being increased by $950,000. This is to continue our promotion of improving the quality of city streets citywide. But we're also deleting four vacant positions in engineering and 13 positions in streets, traffic, drainage, maintenance. We look at the total budget of $47 million. This is how it breaks down, and, and it's pretty um, logical. And we look at half of the department is our streets division, and that makes up about 50% of the overall budget. You'll see the other categories um, and the percentages here, with administration being the second largest, um, then 
course, engineering, field services, the river, project management, and stormwater quality. When we look out towards Oklahoma City and we look at all the different things that the Public Works Department is responsible for, this is just a slide that shows a lot of those infrastructure items um, that uh, we're responsible for maintaining. With over 12,400 traffic signals in our network, 751 signalized intersections, we talk about the city being very large at over 620 square miles, but that also includes over 8,000 lane miles of road, 70,000 traffic control signs, and 53 miles of maintained drainage channel. Um, it's, uh, it's significant, um, and obviously it takes all the resources that we have to keep up with each of these elements. I'm going to go through each of the divisions and just summarize what each does, um, the number of positions that we have in each. So as we talk about a little bit of the reorganization of public works, our engineering division is going to have um, three major categories. We're going to have drainage engineering, we're going to have paving engineering, but then we've also got the technical review. It's going to make up 19 positions for a proposed budget of $1.7 million. One of the primary responsibilities of the engineering division is project management. And so these are the individuals that are responsible for the implementation of the GEO bond program. They also are responsible for the facilities management. This would be all of the building construction for city projects, contract administration, and also right away. And this accounts for 27 of those positions. Just as an update on the 2007 bond, um, a total of $760 million. The vast majority of that, nearly $500 million, was in streets projects at 136 locations. 46% of the 2007 bond is either complete or under construction. So significant progress has been made. Um, looking at the overall streets number of 497 million, 445 of that is in listed projects, 143 is in residential resurfacing, 169 million is in street widening, and there's 133 million in streetscapes. And so we're continuing to implement these projects as quickly as the bond funds are sold and made available. This is an example of, of one of the most recently completed street widening projects on Western Avenue from Northwest 164th to 178th. It's also one of our more, more costly projects because it also included a lot of utility relocations, a complete bridge reconstruction, uh, but this project has uh, turned out to be quite successful and so we're glad to have this one finished. This is another street widening project on Portland Avenue from Southwest 74th to Southwest 104th. This is actually in partnership with the Oklahoma City Airport Trust and so a lot of the funding for this project wasn't just from the bond issue but also from the airport trust as we create this new streetscape as you can see through the decorative fixtures um, in the median. The GEO bond program also includes all different types of resurfacing, so it's also neighborhood resurfacing, which you can see here on Southeast 90th and Button Avenue. These are some of the before and afters. A lot of our residential communities do have pavements that are in the 20 and 30 year um, age range, and so being able to get back into those and resurface those is increasing the quality of life in these neighborhoods. This is another location at Southeast 95th in Bryant Terrace. This was a project that was a little over a million dollars, and as you recall, these are square mile areas of listed projects throughout the city. Moving to uh, arterial resurfacing, we also have a lot of work that's been done on Classen uh, Boulevard. Um, not all of the work on Classen is geo bonds, I mean, that's also been also through fund balance, but there are projects just like Classen where we're starting to improve a lot of the city's arterial streets, not through widening, but through resurfacing as well. As we move into some of the capital projects, and this will be also again as a part of project management, we've got projects like the Intermodal Transit Hub that are currently under construction. I think we've updated on this project before. It's in four phases. Um, the three of four phases have been bid and awarded, and so a lot of work is in occurring here. This is also a Tiger Grant project, so multiple funding sources that include bond funds, MAPS-3 funds, and also grant funds. But that work is proceeding this year with expected completion late 2016, early 2017. And then we've got recently completed projects like the police headquarters that was just finished last year um, at, a, at a cost of $20.1 million. Going on to the next slide, we've also got additional work under construction. This is the new municipal courts. Um, you can see a lot of it is out of the ground today. This is a project that we expect to complete in the spring of 2017 for a cost of $22 million. And then we're proceeding very quickly to wind up the projects regarding to Project 180. And so, what you have on the right is a map of downtown. The green box at the bottom is the Park uh, Mary Botanical Gardens. Um, at the top of the drawing is North 6th Street, but all the streets that are identified in the blue areas are the completed streetscapes. The ones that are a color, either purple or green or orange, are ones that are either proposed or under construction. We recently were able to reopen Park Avenue and Harvey Avenues, the 
construction that is occurring on Hudson at the moment is the reconstruction of the intersection of Hudson and Kerr. So it's one of the final pieces in that core area of downtown. We'll be moving very quickly to the EK Gaylord project, which was recently awarded. Um, and so that's what you see on the bottom right hand side of that drawing and the streetscape projects will be wrapping up officially with those that are on the map here. We do anticipate the possibility of having some contingency funds remaining out of this project and so we'll maybe be able to look at additional projects possibly in the downtown area in the future. On uh, one, Project 1A, one, where are you on the uh, restriping of yeah, some of there? Because so I've noticed on uh, Film Row that it's still still kind of Absolutely. We, we have had some challenges the past year and a half or two with some of the paint quality that was placed in downtown and it's really affecting just the concrete streets only. And I'll share this problem. There's a lot of cities that are having similar, similar challenges. We are actually in a, uh, in a new contract with a different product, a different paint product that has been laid down recently on Hudson Avenue. And uh, we're monitoring that closely to see if it's going to exhibit some of the same problems and challenges that we had with the previous product. Um, we're being told that it's a superior product. It has a higher cost, but obviously we're going to monitor that. Once we can guarantee its performance, we then anticipate restriping a lot of the, the other streets all throughout downtown and Film Row. So I think we just need another month or two of time on that just to make sure it's going to perform. Moving to infrastructure project management, and these are going to be some of the ties that we have to our strategic business plan and leading for results. Um, as a part of the bond program, um, we do target on average about $70 million in contracts each year. You'll see some previous years. Um, you'll also see the estimate for this year, FY15-16 at $70.5 million. We are right on target for this year to complete um, our strategic business plan goals for the bond program. Moving on for also some things that we do for some contractual project management. Um, we're very much in tune with completing projects on time and on budget. Um, this is actually a budget goal where we're actually trying to limit the total number of changes um, on any project. This would include change orders and amendments to 7% of the awarded contract of value. So you're going to see here that we started tracking this just in the past few years. This is something that we originally did not follow very closely and the percentages were much higher. But we're having a 65 to now a 62 percent success rate in making sure that we're managing those costs on projects, which is ensuring their successful completion. Moving on to our next division, field services. Um, number of, uh, of responsibilities in field services, of course, include the construction inspections and the quality of control of any of the work, even if it's done by private contractors in the city's right of way. It's a division made up of 50 staff at a budgeted cost of $4.2 million. One of the strategic business plan measures that we're tracking with this is the ability to complete utility cut repairs um, within 30 calendar days or less and that's just the measure that you see here that is currently ranging at about 60 percent. So these typically follow a lot of the water line breaks or any of the other street work. Um, it's in partnership with our utilities department. Um, those temporary repairs are made. These are the permanent repairs that then go in a little bit later but uh, there, there were some higher number of breaks in the last year that we've noticed. Some of the things that, uh, that can cause that can be also excessive rain or excessive drought, um, just as the ground shifts. But uh, what we've done is we do have two contracts in place. We're adding additional contracts to get this measure back up to our goal of 80%. Moving on to our next division, and this is probably the division that's had the most significant change in just the past few years. There's been a lot of new activities on the Oklahoma River. As we talk about the dams, the SCADA system, and the river maintenance, the number of positions that we have in this division is seven at a cost of $1.7 million. But with just the dams, um, we're able to maintain these. Obviously, there's a lot of proactive maintenance that occurs on these and management is required for those. There's also a lot of the cleaning and other activities that go along the river. With all the new activities in the Boathouse District, um, our call and our need for the removing of debris um, is also increased. And that's what you see here. So, each time it rains, there is a, a lot of debris that gets into the river. And obviously, for the rowers along the river, that debris is not uh, very helpful as they're trying to perform and, and practice in the water. Um, as we look at the amount of debris that's removed each year, last year we removed over 258 tons of debris. This year we've already removed over 175 tons of debris from the Oklahoma River. Um, this is all performed by the Streets Traffic and Drainage Maintenance Division. Yes. Does that debris mainly come from creeks that drain into the Oklahoma River? I mean, what's the source of all that debris? You know, I would tell you it's just anything upstream. So it could, it could be anything that oh. just discharges over land into the river. It could be from just what's upstream in the Oklahoma River itself, but it's also 
um, the North Canadian and the upper reaches than any of the, any of the channels. Okay. So um, what you're seeing in some of the pictures is there's a lot of floatables, a lot of cups, a lot of trash, some small pieces of wood. But I'll tell you, when we pull out large limbs, large timber, um, sometimes large floating objects, um, I think a few years ago we even removed a car. So there was even a car that somehow made its way down the river that was sunken at the time. I see. Thank you. So as the number of maintenance projects increase, this is, a, this is a project that we currently have underway. This is the new river maintenance building at a cost of $1.9 million. It's being funded by the drainage utility. But our need to actually have our resources very close to the river and not specifically at our central maintenance facility at 119th, or excuse me, at 15th in Portland, um, this new structure is being con constructed. Um, it's going to actually hold replacement cylinders that we sometimes need to change out on the dams that raise and lower those gates. It's also the ability for us to store boats and other materials and things. Um, it's right there at the exchange landing, um, just on the south side of the river. Moving on to our next division, stormwater quality. Um, this is the division that's responsible for environmental water quality. They're probably best known for household hazardous waste. Um, but they also do construction industrial permitting and also public outreach, 28 positions at $3.1 million. This is the Household Hazardous Waste Facility. It actually opened in 2003. It's quite successful. Here's some of the specifics um, here just in the last year. There were two special collections at the fairgrounds that collected over 98,000 pounds of waste with over 480 participants. There's actually been 9,300 participants in the facility um, just in the past year. Those would be those that just actually drove through and dropped off materials at the facility collecting nearly 700,000 pounds of waste. Um, there's also MOUs with our adjoining communities, and so we actually work with Edmond, City of the Village, Yukon, Shawnee, Moore, El Reno, War Acres, Bethany, and Tinker Air Force Base. We have agreements where they can also bring materials to the facility for recycling. So they participate in the cost for those, but this is actually more than just an Oklahoma City facility. It's actually a regional facility that's used by a lot of the metropolitan area. This is one of the special collection events, and this last one was held in April of 2016. We took in over 300 pounds of, of unused medications, 46,000 pounds of tires, over 300 pounds of unused ammunition, and about 11,000 pounds of computers. And so, again, we're continuing to work in ways to keep that waste out of the landfills. And this is just one of those events where you can arrive at the fairgrounds if you've got a utility bill. Um, they'll take those debris items and those unused household hazardous waste items from you we'll make sure that they're disposed of properly. And then this is part of our public outreach campaign. So this is Wayne Drop. Um, he's really popular in a lot of our Oklahoma City schools. Um, we actually reach out each year through our pre-K through sixth grade students as we try to educate them on, on green and, and, and good environmental practices. And so um, we, uh, we reach thousands of children um, every year and, and we're, we feel like that's a great benefit to the community. So moving on to our largest division, streets, traffic, and drainage maintenance, you'll see this is the highest number of positions that we have in a single division at 226. Also our largest division in cost at $23.5 million, but they're, they're responsible for the streets, the drainage, traffic operations, and also graffiti removal. So the quality of city streets comes up each year in our citizen survey, and it is the number one concern by our citizens. And so we're very committed to keeping the streets in the best condition possible with available resources. We track that citizen um, result. Um, we're looking for the condition of arterial streets to get a 50% or better citizen satisfaction. And we've been challenged with that. And so over the past several years, you'll see that we've been tracking in the 30% range, and we've dropped this past year to 22%. Now, share that the national average is at 37%. And um, you know, I will say that uh, the, the data that we look at is a little bit confusing because we do see a lot of funding going into city streets. We see a lot of improvements in city streets, but the satisfaction still remains low. This is the residential street ratings. Um, they're slightly higher, still not at the goal that we'd like to see at 50%. Um, you can see this year we're tracking 34%. And again, that national average is around 37%. So we're close to the national average, but definitely not where we've set our targets for Oklahoma City. So we rate streets, and I know that everybody's familiar with this, but just as, uh, just as an update, this is the pavement condition ratings um, for Oklahoma City streets for the past number of years. And so you'll see that we've been tracking those for some time. You're seeing this rating continue to go up. We are actually doing a lot of projects. We've done a lot of street work in Oklahoma City. Um, and so you'll see that uh, at the year end, we, we set a target of 65 as a PCI. Overall, we feel like 70 would be a number that would be uh, an achievement. 
Um, so we're going to continue to strive on city street projects, both in repair and also future projects. So um, that's where I mentioned where the data is, is hard to align when we see the satisfaction still decreasing, but the actual quality of streets measured um, increasing. Um, we'll continue to study that and make sure that we continue doing improvement citywide. Eric, can I say, so how does that, do we just simply ask the citizen in that survey, are you satisfied with the condition of arterial streets, yes or no? There are a number of questions that, there are actually, I think, two to three questions that are included on the citizen survey. They're actually asked with the, the, the uh, how they, the quality of like residential streets and the quality of arterial streets, right? They, the third question is just the overall satisfaction with city maintenance of streets. So um, well, it's just not yes or no. It's, it, isn't it, Doug? Isn't it? Isn't it excellent? Good. Okay. So we're using the data to the best of our ability. I think one of the things that I'll mention kind of today is that uh, we are refocusing on more resurfacing of streets as opposed to some of the widening and other larger projects. And so we think with additional resurfacings, we'll have more lane miles of resurfaced streets in the next year or two. We hope to see that satisfaction rating start to improve again very quickly. A lot of that works also in the residential streets, not just the arterials. So again, we'll be resurfacing a lot of streets in front of homes, not just on our larger street areas. So continuing to monitor that as close as we can. That sounds like something that all cities struggle with. If the average is 37% nationwide, so I, I, I just repeat, you know, we, we know it's a priority of our citizens. Um, we know that we've put the resources towards streets. You know, the bond issues are focused towards street improvements. I know the council's been committed in years past and when additional monies can be made available and place those towards street construction. So we're, we're committed to improving that as, as much as resources are available. There are a number of activities that we do through our streets division, um, either through base repairs. These would be um, more than just a simple pothole repair. We're also doing a lot of different resurfacing type projects. Pothole patching um, obviously is a, is a big priority, but we also do a lot of rural road maintenance. And this is just some examples of some of those that you see here. Um, we do have the ability to do some traditional resurfacing. Um, in the past, we've also done a lot of microsurfacing, but as we look into this next year, we're looking at some new technologies. Um, they're called thin lay resurfacing. It's similar to micro. It uses a little bit different equipment. The crew size is a little bit smaller. But it's two advantages. One is we can do it in-house with a lot of our in-house equipment, but we can also contract it out. So where microservicing was something that only city crews could perform because it had a very specialized machine, there's a new method that we're going to experiment with this upcoming year that looks very similar. Um, but again, as we want to increase that goal of maybe more than 80 miles a year, we have the ability to contract that out and ramp up that service. So these thin lay resurfacing products are a three-quarter inch overlay that requires minimal milling. It's typically done on a street that's in good condition. It can't be one that's completely failed. That's when you have a traditional mill and overlay, but it comes at a fraction of the cost. We can do this micro resurfacing or this thin lay at a cost of twenty to $30,000 a mile instead of two to $300,000 a mile. So you're gonna see some of those new services as we try to push those out and increase our number of streets resurfaced in Oklahoma City. And you can see as an example, we still do a lot of rural road maintenance as well. And that's what you see with this motor grader in the bottom right hand corner. We do service a lot of our rural citizens. Um, and so in wards three, four, and seven, um, we have a lot of those areas that have roads like this. Eric, I'm yes. sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but um, since we're talking about possibly subcontracting out some of the work, not only for this new methodology, but for just street repairs and, and construction in general, a comment that I've heard more than once this past year from people involved in the construction business is that they feel like the subcontract work uh, has not been up to a level of performance that they would have accepted and that they just, every time they see me, encourage me to uh, recommend that we uh, put a greater emphasis on the, uh, when a project is complete in reviewing and approving that by these outside contractors that sometimes for quality, uh, looking at the overall project uh, has not been as good as it should have been. We have had a couple of instances come up in the last year that the work wasn't to a standard. So when we go back and look at the field services division, we do inspections on streets as they're resurfaced even by private contractors. 
that could be on a project the city's committed or it could be on a private development. Um, but we've had a number of contractors that have not performed to the level as expected and remedial work has had to been completed before the project could be accepted. So in some cases, a brand new street that couldn't be accepted had to be remilled and re-overlaid before it met a city standard. And so we are following up on those when those concerns come up. Thank you. Moving to our pothole program, um, you know, with over 8,000 lane miles of streets, a lot of the rain that we received last year, we're actually gonna probably exceed all of our targets on the number of potholes repaired for 15, 16. Uh, but you see here that we target 80% of pothole repairs within three days. And that's been a real challenge this last year, especially last summer as a part of this current fiscal year and meeting our goals. We're currently at 58%. Um, our goal is 80%. Our normal typical year of potholes is about 80,000 potholes a year. And we're gonna easily approach 120,000 potholes in Oklahoma City for this past year. So a significant increase. But we do have over 12 crews that are committed to just pothole repair in Oklahoma City. So our goal, again, is to keep streets safe, um, to make sure that we respond as quickly as they're reported. And then we continue to encourage our citizens to use our action center, to use the city's online services at OKC.gov to make those reports so that we can get out into the field very quickly. That, that seems significant that you have a 50% increase in pothole repairs in one year. Well, with a, with a record year of rainfall, you know, I think we can align that pretty easily. I think we all can't soon forget all the rain that we received last May, June, and into July, where we broke all the records. Um, that was when we saw the most of those potholes right through last summer. We aren't seeing a lot right now. It's fortunate, but uh, our big numbers came last summer. Thanks. So as we look at traffic operations, um, the traffic ops is, is responsible for all of our signal replacements, a lot of our in-house striping programs, and that's some of what you see here. This is equipment, that's city equipment. Um, we also do replacement of signs. We have our own in-house sign shop. Um, so these are some of the activities that you see provided by streets. I see a question there. Um, in my mind, Project 180 has dramatically transformed Oklahoma City. And as it comes to an end, as it's concluded, um, it, to me, from time to time, it seems that the traffic is somewhat sluggish. In other words, what I mean by that is a light turns green, you go about a half block, and then the, the light in front of you turns red. Is there some effort or will there be some effort to help improve the flow of traffic by tripping those lights where they let the traffic flow better? So we are. So one of the updates that I'll provide in just one minute with this ITS is that we've completed the intelligent traffic system. Um, it has the ability to let us program the controllers to do interconnectivity um, anytime we recognize that there's maybe a delay in traffic. I think one of the things that we're starting to see downtown on our new downtown challenge, which is a good one, is they're seeing a lot more pedestrian traffic. So as much as we can time signals and do things to get them coordinated, uh, just as soon as a pedestrian pushes the button to cross the street, you know, a new timer starts that competes with the traffic timer. And so we do let those pedestrians within a reasonable time cross the street, but that will break that that synchronization of the signals at that time. So, you know, yes, we do have the ability to monitor those and make improvements, but I think one of the challenges we have is, is the increased pedestrians, but uh, we'll work with new technology to see if there's additional improvements that we can make. So this is a, a screen of Oklahoma City. It shows a lot of little red triangles. These are all those 750 signalized intersections, and we just completed the ITS project last month. It came to this council um, to declare it complete. It's completed under budget, and uh, it also included the 18 corridors. So even though it originally only included 18 corridors, we're identifying potential for new corridors and with staff's uh, experience to start doing more signal synchronizations. But uh, obviously the effectiveness of this project is we can see the condition of all the signals remotely. Um, we can tell when they go offline. We have the ability to remotely program them. If we send a program that doesn't seem to be working correctly, we can simply reverse that program. So as we grow into the new completed system, I think we're gonna find a lot of opportunities for improvement in the future. And Eric, I know there's a lot of talk about this with regard to the streetcar as well. And so I just wanna mention it again to keep it on radar that we look at programming lights. Absolutely. As we... So as a part of the streetcar conversation, there's been a lot of conversation about signal prioritization, the ability for a vehicle, whether it be a streetcar or we've also started working with Embark um, and Jason Fairbrush on the ability to possibly prioritize a bus, um, looking at bus corridors. The technology is there. Um, there may be some components that have to be installed on a bus. 
There may be some additional components that have to go into the cabinet, but the technology is there to receive this, so that is absolutely something that we're looking at. It's included in the streetcar project already, but I mentioned the bus. That's something that we hope to be able to make a recommendation in the future. This is going to be my last slide as a part of our presentations. We've covered the seven divisions, our, our large portion of our budget. Um, last week, we talked a little bit about the sidewalk repair program, so I just wanted to update quickly on that program this morning. Um, these are the locations that we've received and completed a lot of the sidewalk repair requests. If you recall, City Council approved $100,000 in a program that allowed a 50-50 partnership with residents that had broken or damaged sidewalks needing replacement. Um, we received 173 applications. 144 of those were able to be approved. So the sidewalk had to meet a certain criteria. Not all of them were in the condition damaged enough to require replacement, but 144 were approved. We received payments from 85 of the 144, and of those 85, we've now spent 82,000 of the 100,000 that was set aside for council. So we're continuing to see applications. Um, we have actually confirmed with the budget office that an additional 100,000 has been placed into the budget for next year so that we can proceed another year with the program. So we're seeing good success, and I know that we're getting a lot of great feedback from the citizens that are participating, um, but uh, obviously it's a program that will continue to move forward to improve walkability, not just in the central core areas, but just any areas that have sidewalks in front of residential communities. Eric, how does someone make an application for this? Does it come directly through your office, or can they, can it, they go it to the website? It comes through our office, but it's directly online at okc.gov. So okay. if you go to the new website that was opened up and you go to Departments and Public Works, there's a simple click where you click the sidewalk replacement program and you just follow those simple steps to, to engage. Fabulous. Thank you. Our uh, city crews immediately get out and inspect and we'll be able to tell the resident whether they meet or qualify. We simply then give them the cost share. Once they forward the money, we use one of our internal city contractors to do the work. Yeah. So just as an outlook in, in FY17 and what to expect from Public Works, um, we hope to not have record rainfalls again this year. We do need some rain, but we expect to still repair about 80,000 potholes this year. We have 86 miles of resurfacing planned, 20 miles of new residential sidewalks, over 400 probably infrastructure plans reviews. These would be public and private. There's still a lot of private development that's going on in Oklahoma City. We have 71.8 million targeted as our expenditure goal for the GEO bond program this next year with 52.6 million in facilities. We'll complete probably about 35,000 inspections at a total of about 300 million in total value um, in the upcoming year. With that, um, we'll obviously stay very busy. We appreciate your consideration and happy to answer your questions that you might have about the Public Works budget. Well, I just wanted to thank you, number one, for your leadership and on the bridge on Northwest Expressway in May. Um, I thought you guys did an amazing job and, and your leadership was much appreciated. I was watching people debate back and forth on Facebook about whether it was the state's responsibility or the city's responsibility. When they figured out it was the city's, they, they were relaxed because they knew it would get fixed. Well, so. <laughs> I, I appreciate the... And the, the, I know who I they call. were, and they've been, they've watched, it's because of you. I mean, they know you from meetings, and, and you put them at ease, and, uh, and so I'm very grateful for every, we were very fortunate. Um, but I'm very grateful for everything you guys did. I appreciate that, and it's a, it's a lot of staff. We have a lot of great staff that I've presented to you today that were in the field this weekend. We have great consultants and contractors that were willing to work through the weekend, and so that's been really our success is our partnerships with our community. Um, you know, I can't tell you the number of calls that I got immediately once they saw it on the news. How can we help? Unfortunately, I think, as you've heard reported, there were no injuries on this accident that occurred over the, the on last Thursday that helped us actually move forward even more quickly than we expected. And so, um, so yeah, again, thank you for the kind words. I appreciate that. Eric, you mentioned to me this morning the, what's going to happen in the future as far as May Avenue is concerned. Can you tell the viewers a little bit about what your plans are there? Sure. So um, Saturday evening about 8 o'clock, we, of course, completely reopened Northwest Expressway, which took a big burden off the traffic grid. Um, but uh, there are two undamaged usable lanes of May Avenue um, that have been inspected by the engineers and can be opened but they're both in the west-hand side of the bridge. So we're going to need to weave one of the lanes of traffic from the other side. We're looking at a north lane and a south lane, and simply we're going to have to make some improvements or cuts to the median to get that lane over. So our goal is to have that done this week. We're looking at that right now as we speak. The work will most likely be done in-house, uh, but I hope by Memorial Weekend, by this weekend, we'll be able to have two-lane travel on May Avenue. And then long term, there's three beams that need to be replaced, and we're trying to identify where we can find those beams at this point in time. They're, they're not 
standard beam. So we're trying to find out uh, a location on that. And with that, we'll go forward with it. We, uh, it costs about fifty to $60,000 to do the, the uh, cleanup um, over the weekend. And Eric won't give out a number, but it's between probably a half million and three quarters of a million dollars to, to, to do the repair for the rest of it. Kind of in that, we're, Absolutely. Th don't hold me to that, but it's just to give you a ballpark. We're, we're working on an emergency bid package. This is something that we'll take very quickly through an emergency process. We have declared an emergency in the area. Um, the plan should be completed in just about another week, a little over a week. We'll emergency bid that to contractors that are already ready to receive the plans. We'll award it immediately. Um, and then the beams will be ordered. But it'll actually be the contractors that will find the actual steel or the beams, have them fabricated. And that's our long lead item. They're, you just, they're just not off-the-shelf type products. So uh, but, uh, once we get those beams in hand, we'll have a better idea of what the schedule is to have it completely reopened. I'm, uh, I'm really encouraged by the PCI rating continuing to go up. I'm, I, I'm much more interested in the objective number than the So, um, yeah, I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, Eric. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Can I have? A, can I just ask a question as it relates to the requirements the city has on new development that uh, comes out to an arterial street, whether it's residential or commercial? There's a requirement that that developer puts in a sidewalk. Is that true? Yes. And there's no exceptions that you know of. You know, I will say that uh, there have been a few exceptions in the past mm -hmm. that if we're in a very rural area and there's no connecting sidewalks, and in some cases we've got like a drainage channel that's immediately there that would require some sort of a pedestrian bridge, um, we have reconsidered in a couple of those very remote cases. Right. But the majority of the time, no a sidewalk is required. And can you, do you know when that year, at, I mean, what year that policy was adopted to require that? I, I don't know that, but I can get that to you. I mean, was it 10 years ago? 15 years ago? I, I, I'd say around 10. I really don't know. 10. I, I, we, we can certainly get that information for you. One final comment. I've seen a, an example of uh, a residential development where they did go ahead and put in a sidewalk, uh, you know, along an arterial street. But the connection, when they put in the, the street itself, you know how they put in that little cut in the street to go into a sidewalk? So there's a gap between that cut in the street and the sidewalk, so there's grass growing up in between that section. Who's responsible for that? So if, if I'm picturing this correctly, I mean, when we do a street project, we'll typically put in the ADA ramps that are necessary for the intersection, but Correct. then ultimately it's the property owners that are adjacent to those intersections that then put in those sidewalks. So what I'm envisioning that you're telling me is that there's maybe a property owner that has a small lot maybe next to one that was improved, but he hasn't yet or she hasn't yet improved theirs, it would be the private property owner's responsibility for that grass. Well, it was, it's, let me just kind of give you a better description. It was actually the developer. So it's a pretty long, lengthy sidewalk, piece of sidewalk, but it doesn't connect to the uh, ramp, let's say, that takes you into the street. We would typically look towards the developer or the private property owner to, to finish that. and if. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to follow up yeah, on that I'll, particular Yeah, I'll location. talk with you offline okay. about that, so thank you. Oh, one question. This is really for the council. Those sidewalks are, even though they uh, are along an arterial street, only have to be three feet wide? No, they have to either be five or six feet wide on an arterial. So if it's right behind the curb, it has to be six feet. Okay. If it's, a, if it's behind the curb, they can be reduced to five feet. Okay. If there's separation. If there's separation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is utilities, Marsha Slaughter. And Marsha is giving her final budget presentation today. And I know she's probably pretty excited about that. <laughs> yes, and as nervous as ever. <laughs> so with me is Melissa Fairbrush. Brett Weingart and Sam Samandi, all of whom contribute greatly to the capital program and this budget. Okay, we're good to go. Thank you. So today I'll describe the, what we do, tell you about some of our performance measures, what we take care of, 
I tell you where the where our funds come from because we're completely funded by through enterprise funds, um, and and then we'll talk to you a little bit about the budget changes, which are minor. First, I want to start with some target numbers. We we currently maintain about 6,700 miles of pipe. Next year, we think that's going to go up to about 6,700 miles with improvements made by develop, land development and, and our own investments. We, maintain, we have about 209,000 water customers. That's going to increase by 1.5% up to 212.9. Um, similarly, wastewater customers, uh, about 200,000 of those in the, in the next year. 198,600 solid waste customers, and you might want to know why are those numbers all different. The um, people people that get service from us have a water meter in front of their house, that, or or we're wholesaling water to them. That's that counts as a customer, each each as a group or individually. Um, not everybody has wastewater service. For and for example, we provide service in the city of the village where we're not the wastewater service provider, but we have a lot of individual customers that we serve in the village. Similar, we, we are not a commercial solid waste pr service provider. We provide residential service and some and service to very small businesses who can use the big blue cart as their weekly service. Uh, so those numbers just do all just do all vary with how you get the service. You might have you might have your own septic tank and not need wastewater service. You might be a larger customer and not be getting service from us because we don't compete with commercial operations. This year we expect to treat 36, 36 billion gallons of water for drinking and other purposes, and we expect to take back 24 billion gallons of wastewater uh, to, to treat and dispose of properly. We we'll typically answer about 450,000 customer calls a year. In the next year, you'll see us work on some initiatives that will help give customers other options. Again, you've seen the new, you've seen the new web page, which is great. We're taking advantage of the web page, but we're also expanding using our billing system uh, contracts to help get customers electronic answers as well. We know that customers like texts, uh, and we're working toward texts as a part of the process. Thus far, we're taking, we are providing a lot of information electronically, over the phone, by email. Uh, we're hoping, again, to reduce the total number of calls practically by giving folks other ways to get a, to get a hold of us and get an answer quickly. I, I'm going to work through uh, some of our key measures out of LFR uh, and, and not go into, for example, all of them. The first, the first group of measures involves keeping our workforce safe and qualified. We've been working for the last 10 years to reduce our injury rate. Our injury rate is still higher than we would like, but we're making progress. The, the, we anticipate this year's injury rate, future in, pardon me, the 17 injury rate will be 9.2. It's a little bit above that now. We're working toward other improvements, having people help us get better uh, with our injury rate. The goal is to get to eight or less by 2020. We also, in 2012, we completed a uh, continuity plan that caused us to realize that we we're going to need to develop skills in, in uh, people because 35% of people like me are retiring or we're eligible for retirement in the next 10 years. Um, we developed working with MetroTech, a program we, we shamelessly call Utilities University. Um, we graduated 38 people in the first class last year. We're, we're getting 20 out uh, on Thursday night <laughs> and uh, have, pardon me, 25 graduate Thursday night, and 20 more are in the process potentially to, to complete the work in 2017. Um, our graduates have, we shamelessly call them graduates, have uh, gone to other departments successfully. Um, we're building some really fundamental skills that have helped long-term employees uh, get some advancement, uh, build some holes in their experience for them. And we're really pleased to have been able to do that. Um, Moving on to financial management, this fall you'll see a cost of service study and rate up that will produce a rate update for the water and wastewater utility. We promised that we'd come back to that this year, so that's in the pipeline. Uh, and we're working hard to maintain our 
AAA ratings, uh, of which, of course, we're also very proud. So we measure service reliability in a lot of different ways. Uh, we are getting out of neighborhoods, and uh, we are getting our solid waste routes done by 5 p.m. this year, 95% of the time. We hope to improve that, um, and we know we have the commitment of a better contractor and city staff to do that. In, in line maintenance, we make repairs to water lines and to wastewater lines, uh, water work orders and wastewater work orders in 72 hours. We do that 70% of the time when it's a water line maintenance improvement, 80% of the time when it's, when it's a wastewater work order. And that has to do with the complexities of shutting out an area for water versus uh, wastewater. It's just a little bit different repair process. We maintain regulatory compliance. For the water treatment plants are 100% regulatory compliant. The wastewater treatment plants are 98% regulatory compliant. One of my favorites is environmental stewardship. We have three things to talk to you about. This year we'll be purchasing 16 additional CNG-fueled trucks, mostly in solid waste. Actually, I think all of, all of 16 of those are in solid waste this year, pardon me. In our water conservation program, we've begun working with homeowners associations, attempting to get uh, uh, medians and things that homeowners associations uh, maintain, uh, helping them be as efficient as possible in their water use, but that extends then to the neighborhood as well. Lots of good dialogue going on uh, with neighborhoods through the Neighborhood Alliance and, and other programs, helping us uh, get the word out about how we can help with sprinklers. Also on the web page, there's a link to squeezeeverydrop.com, which is the page we've set up for conservation. It includes things like how often do you water a calculator created by the Mesonet people that, that can help you just determine whether you need to water uh, and a lot of great tools about plants and, and conservation gardens. Finally, um, in the budget, we're saying we'll, we'll reuse 2.9 billion gallons of treated wastewater. So that's well over 10% of the volume of water, the, the volume of wastewater that we treat every year. This, this actual fiscal year, we think we're going to hit 3.5 billion gallons. It's pretty exciting. And that's really about power plant use, um, the uh, two highly efficient gas-fired power plants using treated wastewater from us for the cooling water system. Um, and, and then we also sell water to one golf course. Oops. OK. So the department's funded through revenues uh, generated by Aqua and OSEAT. The total source of revenue and expenditures, pardon me, the total sources uses of funds for the two trusts is for, is just under $440 million. About, uh, there will be debt financing for a very large water CIP, I'll describe later, of $134 million as one of those sources of funds. Total um, direct fees and charges, uh, including things like system development charges, are about $305 million. Um, wastewater service charges are $95 million of that, solid waste service. 50.1, pardon me, 51 million, and water charges 145 million. Aqua itself uh, ha has not seen a proposed budget yet, but we believe that the Aqua operations will total 21 million dollars. That helps us pay. That pays for things like um, the annual fees that we pay for maintenance of uh, federal lakes from which we draw water. Uh, it pays for memberships and technical organizations that help support us and keep us uh, up to date with what's going on in places like Flint, Michigan. Um, contracted wastewater operations is about $16 million this year. And again, city operations, $85.4 million for Aqua. Um, the, when you see that number, that doesn't quite match what's in your budget, and the reason is we transfer the money from the trust to the, to, to the accounts to pay bills for the trust uh, only as we need to. So it tends to be about 5% less than what we actually budget. This is 84 point, it's 84.84.4 for Aqua, and it's another 11.1, .1, I think, for OC, and that doesn't quite add up to the $100 million we'll talk about in a second. OC total sources and uses of funds, $53.4 million. 
um, I, I would say it again that Operation 11.1, um, all the capital will be will be paid as you go. They have a, a tiny debt service for the for the uh, operations building that was constructed seven or eight years ago. Service contracts for OC are 54% of the total income at $29 million. That's um, uh, landfill costs. It's, it's uh, waste management's collection program, including recycling. It's uh, other fees and charges related to street sweeping, uh, the myriad of things that, that solid waste provide, provides services for. Um, so this page tells you the, the big picture for the budget. It's $100.8 million. Uh, it's 774 people. It's an increase of two people. Um, let me just talk briefly about the divisions. The administration headed, headed by Brett. Uh, those are our, that's finance. That's that they're paying, that their budget pays the transfer to the general fund for expenses. It pays the uh, pay as you go, pardon me, it makes the payment uh, that we make for the lease on the aqua property, the lease payment we make to the city for the property that we lease from, uh, from the city for the water trust, for example. Um, there's some fairly direct kinds of uh, things you wouldn't have thought of in our budget. The customer service are the people who read the meters repair the meters, uh, go out and talk to customers about, <laughs> about their use and, and whether, we, uh, whether there's a problem with use. They're the people who go out and resolve billing disputes, things like that. Those are all the people on the phones taking those 450,000 calls a year. Engineering uh, implements the capital program. The city engineer provides, uh, provides great direction in selecting firms and negotiating contracts with firms. We take it from there and, and are the project managers for the water, waste, water, and solid waste projects by and large. Marsha, can I ask a quick question? Um, is engineering also where we do review, plan review for commercial development? It is. So we're, the water, we're doing the water, waste, water plan review um, actually, and do a little bit of solid waste review. They, uh, it, it's one of the divisions. So we have a capital division. We have a, a, a records maintenance program. We have a new raw water program. And um, and yes, I'll review all plans. Okay, are we adding some folks or adding some positions there? We have we, we have been um, disappointing this year in our in the speed at which we've reviewed plans. And and frankly, we've been really good at it. So, but we but we've had uh, three different personnel Couple of changes that have set us back. So, Mr. Smithy's uh, hired a new engineer to assist, and and is about to get his uh, support staff, the people who are the uh, engineering aides and, and engineering assistants who do a lot of the heavy lifting get those positions refilled. Great. I, I have had a couple of calls you know, over the we, course of the last six weeks that things seem to be a lot slower. We, we bragged about, I bragged about how we're training people. It, it, it's been really, we thought we did a, we thought we did a good job preparing, but you can't quite, pre yeah, it, this is the place where it showed up as, yeah, as a problem. Thank you. I'm glad to hear. So line maintenance is our largest division, and they're the people who are repairing the pipes. You see them all over town with big trucks and the backhoes uh, when there's an emergency. Those are the folks who are fixing it. And, uh, we, uh, and in this budget, I'll talk a little bit about change for line maintenance. Wastewater quality is the, is the division that operates our wastewater lift stations and also manages our contract for operations of the wastewater treatment plants. Water quality runs the Atoka pipeline. Uh, the, lakes from Atoka to Hefner, um, the, the, the people who treat the water, run the three water treatment plants, uh, and uh, manage a lot of property uh, around the lakes, in a sh much in a shared relationship with the Parks Department. And solid waste, finally, those are the, people, those are the city staff members who um, collect weekly trash, bulky waste. We don't provide recycling services ourselves, of course. Uh, they're also doing um, litter cleanup, litter and debris collection, for example, um, and complaint writing. Uh, they, and they manage the collection contract that waste management provides for us and the other uh, total of $29 million worth of assorted annual contracts. So $100 million in the budget, 
two changes. Um, line, maintenance is, line maintenance asserts, and I believe, that if we do more valve maintenance, we will be able to reduce the total number of houses that we take out of service or businesses we take out of service when we make a, a repair to a to water pipeline. Um, uh, we have uh, looked for national standards for that to see whether we're, uh, we're in line. We can't find national standards, although we found a little bit of research. And, and so for this year, what, I, what, I have rec what I'm recommending is that we take some overage positions that exist and we put them to work concentrating on valves and start to see what it will take, how much time it might take and how much we can get done to measure the cost effectiveness of doing this work. I think it's I explained that it's very difficult for them to say, yes, we clearly made a difference here. They can start attacking some of our larger customers that are higher risk uh, as, a, as a good place to look for look for something to focus on, and that's what they'll do. Uh, um, we'll be back next year to talk about whether this worked and whether we think that this is the right thing to do to proceed. I, I think utility worker ones tend to be entry-level people. This is a great place for people to learn how to make simple repairs on pipes without uh, being in the deep trench or busting a lot of stuff open. At water quality, we're implementing a sludge, sludge dewatering facility. With that. So historically, we make sludges, the stuff that comes uh, out of the water as we're cleaning it. You can picture it's lake water when we start, it's drinking water when we're finished. And so that, that stuff that made it cloudy, it has to come out. That's what's in sludge. We put that, right now we put it in a lagoon. It's been very cost effective. We, we decant the water off the top so that it gets thickened and thickens and thickens over time. It, we have become a big utility. and. And I either need to build another 300 acres of ponds <laughs> or, or do water, so, we're, so we went with dewatering. Um, that will take us a couple of people. I said, uh, um, for those of you familiar with equipment, this, this uh, I think will be a belt filter for us. Um, there are only a couple of options for, for what we do. Um, it, it works. It requires constant attention. It's, it's a chemical process that uh, we'll get optimized, but it'll take us a while. Um, and it, when it's not optimized, it makes a mess. And it doesn't get dry enough. So that's it. Um, total cost is $334,000. It adds two positions, $200 million for electricity and chemicals, and $15,000 for parts and supplies. Okay, we're going to hit the capital, impro capital program relatively quickly. Uh, this is the new high service pump station at the Draper Water Treatment Plant. It pumps 80 million gallons a day and it lets us, when it, when it goes into operation, it will let us get 100% of the capacity of the Draper Water Treatment Plant out to customers. Right now we can get 125 million gallons a day out. When this goes in, we'll be able to get more than 150 out reliably. This map is um, a simplistic approach to the capital improvement program. What's in green are the water, program, water projects that are underway. They're either in design or in construction. What's in blue are the things that are coming new next year. Red, wastewater projects in construction or underway. Uh, tan, wastewater projects that are coming next year. It, the dots are either a neighborhood where we're doing main, main replacements or an improvement at the plant or a pump station. So it can be a, uh, for example, uh, at north of Lake Draper, we're putting in a new road there. That's, uh, it's a dot. At the Draper plant, we're putting in some chemical feed systems and, the, uh, and, a, and a second pump station that takes water from the lake into the plant. Um, okay. um, concentrate a bit on, on the future wastewater first. You'll see a line up on the northeast side of town. That's 
us taking the Adenji plant out of service. It's a tiny plant built in the 1940s. We're going to pump that wastewater over to uh, the North Canadian plant. We have other wastewater improvements that are important. We're adding additional capacity to carry wastewater through the center of, of South Oklahoma City, just south of the, south of the river, um, and, and also in the far west where we have, in all those cases where you see a squiggly line that's a wastewater line, that's, that's us providing more capacity because we've grown and, and customers are using more capacity. That's a, a good thing from a utility standpoint. The, uh, talking then about the water system, the uh, very last uh, improvement on the uh, on our southwest expansion of water supply where we, where we uh, five years ago had serious problems getting enough water to the southwest. Uh, there's that short little green line out at the far, uh, far west that is the last half mile of that program. Um, uh, and perhaps most significantly, we're starting construction of facilities that will tie the north system with the south system in a way that may not allow us to get water to each and every person, north or south, but we'll get it to more than 90% of those customers. It's, it's, resiliency is the key phrase here and, and what we're focusing on. They are um, the line east-west across um, the, the, the green line east-west in the south, the green line uh, north-south at, at Council Road will play a part in that. The uh, improvements that are, that are getting ready to go to construction on Council Road uh, further north will play a part in tying that together with, with the Hefner plant. Um, and finally, the squiggly blue line in the center of town is, is um, a pump station at uh, the Hefner Water, or pardon me, at Overholzer and a pipeline that helps again tie those systems together, big pipes uh, working together pump stations that will go both, both directions, north or south. Uh, it's a big change for us. But it's pretty exciting. I think for, for I don't want to, do, to brush over the CIP, but in the interest of time, the, what we're doing is, um, again, we have a lot of work going on at the Draper plant. This is the sludge system coming out of the ground. This is the big tank that will work, will be the first clarifier to help reduce the volume of wastewater. We, we're starting work. We've authorized $15 million. You've authorized $15 million in contracts to do the engineering for the second Atoka pipeline. Our first work on the pipeline is going to be to, re, to repair, replace the what are called surge tanks, the things that keep the water uh, from hitting, breaking the pipe, uh, a, very, a very important piece of the water system. We're making general repairs this year. Uh, you've seen the dots in all water and sewer rehabilitation and new, and new capacity. And similarly in solid waste, the capital program there is always collection system equipment uh, replacement. In this case, we in this year, we spent $1.5 million to pay off the lease, the lease purchase of the CNG fueling facility at solid waste headquarters. So next fiscal year, more pipes. This is the, that pump station I showed you previously coming out of the ground. This is how it gets started. This is the base pour. Uh, I mentioned the surge tank pro projects for, for the Toka pipeline. Um, those are at multiple locations along the pipeline. Again, water line replacements, sewer line replacements. We'll be doing about $4.5 million of water main replacements. Uh, $18 million worth of transmission mains, again, focusing on the interconnection. Uh, we'll be spending $40 million on treatment improvements, notably that we'll be installing an $8 million uh, project to loop power around the Draper plant now, now that it will have its backup power. We need a way to make certain that the, the, the plant's power system is resilient to that backup power. You'll recall that after the 2013 uh, tornadoes through more, we were able to uh, get a grant for installing uh, permanent generators at Draper to make certain that, again, that supply is resilient to, to uh, South Oklahoma City. 
Total water CIP is $186 million. The sewer CIP for this year is about $30 million. $22 million of that is the pipelines that we're building. We won't be doing much plant work. It's all about the, it's, it's all about capacity to make sure we keep sewage <coughs> in the pipes. And finally, the solid waste CIP is about $4.9 million. $1.2 million of that is carts and, carts and bins. So we'll be buying some more little recycling bins. We'll talk to you about options for that in a few weeks uh, separately. We're, uh, and the rest, the $3.6, $3.7 million is for new equipment. So is it, is it next week that on the 31st we're going to be looking at the solid waste options? or is it, yeah. So next week, not to vote on them, but to just to have them laid out to you as what our options would be with the new solid waste contract. I'm happy to answer questions. Well, I just also want to thank, thank you for your service. So there's this, I felt really good like, with those last slides with the big Atoka pipeline. Um, I think that looking at like Lake Mead, which has record low levels, I think this century you'll see ocean levels rise and coastal cities will, will have some problems and, and potentially you'll have some migration. And those cities that are able to provide reliable water will thrive. And I, I, I just feel good about Oakland City's future and what you've done. And I hope that everybody remembers what they will part and play in that because I think that it, it's security for Oakland City for decades. And I'm very grateful. Well, thank you. Um, obviously, it, it takes a village. Um, and, and a lot of, so we have eight consultants helping us with the Atoka Pipeline. Um, we're very excited about about that process uh, and, and what it holds. It's rare that you get to work on an intergenerational project like that one. Uh, it's, it's been really exciting to be associated with that. Yep. Marsha, I'd like to say the same. Thank you so much for your leadership. We really appreciate the opportunity to work with you for the last seven years. We've in, been in great hands, and I know we'll get a chance to say thank you again before you retire, but this is a good time to, to say thank you for everything you've given to the city. Thanks. I know, Marcia, uh, Vice Mayor, I know there's not many of us here today, but could we give her a big hand? Yeah, sure. <laughs> let, let me add something to that. I, I tell you, I've, uh, I've been involved with the water system since 1986, and uh, when we changed to an enterprise system of accounting for it. And a couple of things I'd want to point out is that I think the management and the way the, the water trust has operated since it was since it became an enterprise accounting system and inter in operated as a separate enterprise within the city is the best illustration I can think of is that government can make things work. And with the exception of being able to hire your brother-in-law, we run it like a business uh, over there. And it's a good, it is a good operation. It's a clean operation. It, the, the finances are well managed. Uh, there's uh, borrowing is uh, a part of it, but it's been done in a very, um, very conservative way. We've taken advantage of the low interest rates over the last few years, and we've done a really good job. And all, everybody here that's involved in that deserves some of that credit. I, I remember a couple of years ago, I asked Marsha, I said, you need, to be, you need to stay as long as I'm going to be here. And I asked her about that the other day when she announced that she was going to retire. And she said, yeah, I said that, but I didn't realize you're going to stay that long. <laughs> so so I, uh, I, I, I appreciate it. I think, as Ed said, I think of all the things that Oklahoma City's done over the past 50 or 60 years to move itself forward, there's probably no better example than the way we've done with water. We, we, we stand on the shoulders of those council members that in the 50s and early 60s that lost their seats as a result of voting for this expansion of this system. And uh, Marsha's done a great job, and I appreciate it personally very much. I agree. Thanks, Marsha. All right, now uh, it's time for opportunity for public comment. Is there anybody who wants to make a public comment? It doesn't look like... Like it, so uh, we will adjourn the finance committee and reconvene the council meeting with items from council. Ed, you got anything? Nope. Pete. David. Meg. 
go thunder. All right, I, I agree. <laughs> Just, Mark. just briefly, Vice Mayor, we have a uh, workshop scheduled for this Thursday night in Ward 8. Uh, it's in conjunction with the Oklahoma City Parks and Recreation Department, and it's to discuss capital improvements for our parks in Ward 8. Uh, it's 6 to 8 p.m., like I said, Thursday, May 26th at Church of the Servant. The public is invited. We'd love to have uh, lots of people turn out to discuss our parks. The other thing, I think it's important to... Um, to acknowledge and applaud people that the companies that decide to invest in Oklahoma City, and in today's paper, uh, Boeing announced that they just sold 100 planes at a contract price of 11.3 billion dollars, and GE just announced a 1.4 billion dollar uh, industry and manufacturing project. And so, uh, I salute those two companies who have chosen to invest in Oklahoma City. All right, city manager reports. Just want to point out that uh, in two weeks from today, on June 7th, we will have uh, presentations by the Parks Department, airports, and by Development Services, and then we'll look at adopting the budget on the 14th. Okay. And has anybody signed up for citizens to be heard? Okay. Well, with that, we're adjourned. Thanks.